A warm welcome to everybody joining. Uh, thank you for having a look at this. It's John Weaver, a picture of John Weaver, who was a scholar and a poet in his 55th year in 1631. A bit old for what I'm really wanting to illustrate, but it's the only picture we have of him. Um, he was actually a great deal younger. He was just over 20 years old when he wrote uh, the poem that I want to show you in which he discusses William Shakespeare. And he uh, was one of the five uh, people who published on William Shakespeare during the 1590s who all knew extremely well um, that William Shakespeare was a pseudonym. And he shows us that, but he also knew that William Shakespeare was involved in a scandal, the scandal that is mentioned in William Shakespeare's sonnet, a vulgar scandal upon his brow. And uh, Weaver hides it cleverly, but you can find out what the scandal is by reading attentively, and that's what I'm going to show you today. William um, Covell was the tutor to John Weaver at Cambridge University, at Queen's College. And some of you will remember, if you've seen my short upload, Advertising a Scandal, on YouTube, you'll know that William Covell, in his work Polymantia, that I'm illustrating at the bottom here, um, reveals what that scandal is, and John Weaver clearly knows exactly what the scandal is too. In fact, as we go on, um, I'm going to show you some other people from Cambridge. Cambridge seems to be the, the hotbed of tittering, gossiping, and encrypting evidence about Shakespeare's vulgar scandal. So we're going to look at Weaver doing it. Um, uh, the scandal, in a nutshell, is very simple. I don't know if any of you have read, I'm sure you have, Troilus and Cressida, in which that honey-sweet lord Pandarus um, gets his niece Cressida together with Troilus and then sidles up to Cressida and says um, if you have a boy can I have it? Um, he wants an heir, Pandarus does, and at the end of the play of course he's um, excluded from court on account of his vulgarity. Um, exactly the same happened to Edward de Vere and of course Edward de Vere who's writing Shakespeare poems is confessing his his life through his works. So there's a huge number of uh, parallels between Edward de Vere's life and especially his scandals and what goes on in the Shakespeare plays. He's taking this, of course, from Ovid, whose favourite poet he was, Ovid, and who confesses his life through his works. So Edward de Vere um, persuades his mistress, Penelope Rich, who's the dark lady in the sonnets, um, and uh, a young youth who he's very obsessed by, Henry Rosely, third Earl of Southampton, he persuades them to surrogate an heir for him, who turns out to be Henry uh, de Vere, the 18th Earl of Oxford. And that is a scandal which you would see not only provokes Edward de Vere to start using the name Shakespeare, which he does in 1593, right in the centre of when this scandal is going on, um, and it also persuades him to really to disappear from court life, just as Pandarus does. OK, so we're going to look at how Weaver tells us about this, this, this brilliant Cambridge um, poet, um, and it's in this book called Epigrams, in the oldest cut and newest fashion. Epigrams, by the way, are poems that very, very often deal with scurrility. Um, they are very often moralistic in tone. Um, they often deal with um, uh, libels, which they do in a very enigmatical um, an ambiguous way, so saving themselves from being sued. However, um, epigrams were banned by the bishops because they um, tended to uh, contain so much filth in them, particularly filth about people in high places. Okay, so uh, John Weaver writes at the very beginning of this book, uh, Intentio Operis et Authoris, i.e. the intention of the work and the author, and he makes it very clear, it is to whip and scourge, my chiefest meaning is, with seven sour rods laid full seven weeks in piss. Yet pleasure, profit, pride, nor praise allures me to whip and scourge, but virtue that procures me to. So in other words, he's saying that in a slightly uh, pompous way, uh, that it is virtue, the pursuit of virtue, that encourages him uh, to whip and scourge and to um, uh, stop people behaving badly. An interesting fact that when, as I say, this is, contains one of only five printed references to Shakespeare of the 1590s, how feeble the uh, standard Stratfordian scholars have been because... Uh, with the exception of one of them, only one I have found, 
who seems to realise that Weaver is being rude about Shakespeare here. The rest of them just weakly and wetly don't bother to read this and think, well, it's just praising him. Well, it's not, as we're about to see. Now, we're going to try and work out how to read these, and there's a big, big clue in Weaver's name, John Weaver. Um, if you, again, look in the front matter of this book, there's a little poem by someone called Edward Gurney, and it's written to the author. Of hemp and wool our country weavers make such kind of cloth as keeps us whole and clean. This silken weaver subtler loons gin take, and seven weeks web hath warped with finer beam. His cloth discovereth vice, adorning virtue's law, wherefore of greater price than weavers heretofore. Now that, uh, innocent enough, it's playing around with the word weaver, but actually it's giving us a great clue about how to read these little poems. Um, we learn that um, he's made a cloth, uh, he's weaved a cloth, he's woven a cloth, um, through which we discover vice. And it's very important when reading these poems to understand that we are looking at a cloth or a tapestry. And the great failing of Stratfordian scholars up to now is they look at one epigram at a time and they say they don't really understand that and then they move on. Uh, of course they don't understand it because the whole point is it is a woven cloth. You have to pull the thread from one of the epigrams to another. And there are about 160 epigrams in this thing. I'm not going to look at them all, of course. But what Weaver seems to be doing is linking epigrams together to give a, a, a broader meaning and understanding of what's going on. And it's precisely the Shakespeare scandal. We're going to pull a piece of, of, of uh, thread out of this cloth that relates to the Shakespeare scandal, and we're going to follow it and see where it leads us, and it tells us a lot. So let's uh, get on with it. Um, I just have to do one thing first, and that is to explain to you how, I suppose one could call them nicknames were used, of these three people, uh, the people involved in the scandal, Edward de Vere, Penelope Rich, and Henry Rosely. Now, many of you who have read books on Edward de Vere will know perfectly well that apart from calling himself Shakespeare, he was called um, Apollo and Phoebus by his contemporaries. There's actually a very obvious reason for that, because he was right at the centre of art's patronage. And of course, um, uh, Apollo and Phoebus, Phoebus is Apollo, by the way, it's a nickname for Apollo, meaning uh, the god of the sun. And he was, of course, the great uh, patron, the patron of all patrons, the patron of the muses. And so in the 1580s and 1590s, um, even back as far as the 70s, we find uh, people like Gabriel Harvey, Angel Day, uh, John Southern, uh, Thomas Coriat, Henry Locke, Lucas de Hare, Francis Mears, you will have seen an upload I've done on that, Francis Mears, Mears New, Thomas Watson. All of these people uh, referred to Edward de Vere as Apollo, Phoebus, Phoebus Apollo. Thomas Nash, 1596, says... Being first in our language, I have encountered that repurified poetry from art's pedantism and that instructed it to speak courtly, our patron, our Phoebus, our first Orpheus, or quintessence of invention he is. Thomas Nash's amazing praise for Edward de Vere as our Phoebus. Um, OK, if we move to Penelope Rich, um, she is very, very frequently described by her contemporaries as Venus, the goddess of love. Um, Sydney has Penelope Rich, I quote, wearing Venus badge in every part of thee. Um, Spencer, Edmund Spencer, compares her to fairest Venus. The poets loved her, by the way, of course, um, as Henry does Henry Locke in Ecclesiastes in 1597. Um, she's compared to Venus in Breton's Britain's Bower of Delights in 1591 and by Brisket in the Morning Muse of Thestilis. Alexander Craig, another poet not so well known, calls her Venus in his Amorose. And she's called the lovely Venus in the front matter of Sylvester's Dubartus. Uh, Penelope Rich, uh, as alluded to by the title and content of a book called Philip's Venus, and extraordinarily, she actually acted the part of Venus at court. She was bar none, the woman associated with Venus in her day. Um, so not only was she Venus, though, but she's also Stella and Diana. Um, Sally Varlow, who is um, Penelope Rich's biographer, she says that uh, Penelope Rich was identified equally as Stella and as Diana in her day. Uh, the reason she was stellar, of course, is because of Philip Sidney's very famous uh, sonnet sequence, 
uh, called Astrophil and Stella. She is the Stella of, of, of those sets of poems, so referred to as Stella by Philip Sidney and by others who recognised that she was Stella in those poems. And for exactly the same reason, she is known um, as Diana. Uh, in fact, Philip uh, Sidney himself refers to her as Diana in Arcadia, uh, but she is also more famously the Diana of Henry Constable's sonnet sequence called Diana, Praises of His Mistress. And Bartholomew Young in 1598 praised, and I quote, the singular knowledge and delight wherewith she entertaineth and embraceth this particular subject of Diana. So she has Monty Miles, uh, famous Diana, is in translation is dedicated to her. And Thomas Morley um, also wrote songs to her as Diana. Um, and Charles Tessier, the French lutenist, dedicated two songs to her, one as Stella and one as Diana. Um, I'm adding Lucretia there because anyone who's seen the upload I've done on Polymantia will realise the importance of Lucretia, which is a word meaning rich, and she is identified as Lucretia by um, William Covell in Polymantia, and uh, also, I think, by Shakespeare, and certainly in Willoughby has a visa. Um, finally, let's just look at Henry Rosalie. I mean, his name is said to be pronounced Rosalie, and there's a lot of evidence for that. There's a man called Martin Green who wrote a whole book called Rosalie's Roses, and he also writes a separate paper explaining how Rosalie is pronounced Rosalie and the identification of Rosalie with roses. Um, Thomas Nash writes, uh, To Southampton, sweet flower of matchless poetry and fairest bud the red rose ever bear, in his choice of Valentine's. Um, Shakespeare compares him as the fair youth 13 times to roses in his sonnets and actually addresses him as my rose in sonnet 109. Uh, in sonnet 95 he writes, How sweet and lovely dost thou make the shame which like a canker in the fra fragrant rose doth spot the beauty of thy budding name. Well, he's only got a, a budding name, of course, because he's called Rosalie. Um... I put in there rose cheek to Donis. That's something that appears in the second verse of Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis. OK, um, enough of these nicknames, but it's going to help to understand it. Um, now, what we're going to do then is I've pulled out um, uh, one of the epigrams by Weaver, and I'm going to show you that why I've pulled it out, because it quite obviously refers to Shakespeare, even though it doesn't say the name Shakespeare. Um, it is addressed in spurium quendam scriptorum, which means to spurious, a certain writer. So in other words, it's addressed to a writer who is spurious, either that's to say um, he's under a pseudonym. If you look up spurious in the dictionary, we know what it means, not proceeding from its reputed origin, source or author. So a spurious writer is one who is not the writer um, accredited on the title page. So let's read it quickly. Apelles, Apelles, by the way, is um, ancient Greek artist, painter. Apelles did so paint fair Venus queen that most supposed he had fair Venus seen. But thy bald rhymes of Venus savour so that I dare swear thou dost all Venus know. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Now, in the beginning of um, Weaver's epigrams, he says they are written for the year in which they're written. So obviously we're talking about some contemporary here who is spurious. He's written a poem about Venus. Well, we know that Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis was printed at least four times by 1599 when Weaver's poems came out. So anyone reading this at the time would know that the most famous poem about Venus, bar none, was Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis. And we're being told that uh, the writer is spurious. Well, we all know that because Shakespeare's is a pseudonym, obviously. Um, uh, what else is this little thing telling us? Um, Thy bald rhymes of Venus savour so that I dare swear thou dost all Venus know. Well, that's a real nudge, nudge, wink, wink. What he seems to be saying is that uh, you know Venus so well, the model for your Venus and Venus and Adonis, that I'd say you know her all, i.e. you uh, sleep with her. In the biblical sense to know is to have sexual intercourse with someone. Um, thy bald rhymes, that's a little, another little clue. Anyone who's read uh, Gabriel Harvey's letters to Spencer, Emerito, will know that uh, Edward de Vere and his entourage were publicly excoriated as bald rhymers. So it's a big clue about Edward de Vere, to, certainly to anyone from Cambridge who would have known that. 
book of Harvey's bald rhymes is, is referring to Oxford. Um, so I'm going to start a little list up here. Um, we know that he uh, put it under Shakespeare. He's published a poem about Venus under a pseudonym, we can tell from this poem. Um, uh, a woman, Venus, is his mistress. That can be taken from this poem. And uh, therefore I'm going to put under the Venus column uh, that she's a mistress of the pseudonymous Venus poet. Uh, you may think that's all we've managed to gather from that. As I say, there's a little hint in bald rhymes uh, that maybe Edward de Vere is the person um, being referred to here. Notice also two sets of double Vs. Um, as we know, Edward de Vere signed himself double V, D-O-U-B-L-E-V, double V, in a uh, published work by his secretary, John Lilly. And he seems to identify with double V, um, standing for... Uh, vero nil verius, his motto. But here we've got two sets of double Vs, implying that double V, i.e. Edward de Vere, is doubled. Look at the number of the epigram, it's number 11, 1-1, one, one, what I might call a double number. If we double 1-1, one, one, we get to 22, another double number. And what do we have in epigram 22? Um, it's an epigram to William Shakespeare, who's also wrote, written a poem about Venus. So already, just by pulling on this thread, we're linking to another, another epigram, and we can see that Shakespeare seems to be spurious, i.e. he's not the name, uh, not the real writer. Let's see how this starts. Honey-tongued Shakespeare, when I saw thine issue, I saw Apollo got them, and none other. Well, that has a, a double meaning, which is pretty obvious. Honey-tongued Shakespeare, great persuader Shakespeare, when I uh, read your works, I assume they were so good they were by Apollo, no one other than Apollo. Well, as we know, Edward de Vere is the Apollo of 1599. He's the person who's most called Apollo. Um, and so the suggestion there is the same suggestion as we had when we called him spurious in epigram 11, that Shakespeare is not the real writer's name, that it's someone else wrote those poems called Apollo. So let's put that in the Apollo column. He's called Shakespeare but his honey-tongued poems seem to be by Apollo. Now, this, of course, has a double meaning and a very deliberate one. When I saw thine issue, I swore Apollo got them. Got is to beget. Issue, of course, is also children. Now, we're all sick to death of the vain and hopeless attempts of Stratfordian scholars trying to look through this to say, oh, it just means he's praising Shakespeare as a writer. So I'm now going to take that double meaning and show you how it, how the double meaning follows through, that what this is actually about is, is a scandal in which Shakespeare's so-called children are not his children, or at least one child. It's put in the plural here, but I think it's referring only to one, which is Henry Vere, who became 18th Earl of Oxford, who was not uh, the natural son of Edward de Vere. Okay, so that's what we're going to follow this thing about uh, Shakespeare's issue, okay? Their rosy-tainted features clothed in tissue. Tissue doesn't mean lavatory paper, it means highly expensive cloth. So they're very well-dressed, these uh, children of Shakespeare, and they have rosy-tainted features. Not rosy-tinted, notice it's tainted. A taint is a stain, it's something that shouldn't really be there. It's there due to some shameful or moral aberration, and they are rosy-tainted. Let's put that into the Shakespeare column. His offspring have rosy-tainted features. Some heaven-born goddess said to be their mother. Well, that's quite easy to, to unravel that bit. The heaven-born goddess has to be Venus. And the reason for that is Venus is born of Urania. And Urania means heaven or of heaven. So the heaven-born goddess is born of Urania, born of heaven, is Venus, uh, said to be the mother. So let's put that into the Venus column, said to be the mother of Shakespeare's rosy, tainted issue. Uh, Rose-cheeked Adonis with his amber tresses, fair fire-hot Venus charming him to love her. Rose-cheeked Adonis with his amber tresses. Well, uh, rose-cheeked Adonis, we remember that is what is said of Adonis in uh, Venus and Adonis and applies to Henry Rosalie. Um, interesting about amber tresses, actually, because nothing is said about amber tresses in Shakespeare's poem, Venus and Adonis. So why does uh, Weaver put that in, to, in here? Well, the reason, obviously, is because 
Henry Rosely, the third Earl of Southampton, was very famous indeed for his amber tresses, which you can see in the picture in the top right of your screen. Um, so it's a big clue about uh, the Earl of Southampton. Fair, fire-hot Venus, charming him to love her. Well, that's pretty interesting. So let's put that into the Venus column and into the uh, Rosely column. Uh, Venus is the seductress of rose-cheeked Adonis. Uh, so I'll put in the in Rosely's column, he's seduced by Venus. So that's already getting very close to what we know about the Shakespeare sonnets. Shakespeare has a mistress. We've seen that in Epigram 11, who is sometimes called Venus. And that Venus seems to be um, having it off, let's say, with Henry Rosely, 3rd Earl of Southampton. Um, they burn in love. I'm skipping down to the bottom of this poem here. They burn in love thy children, Shakespeare. Well, we've just been told uh, that fair, fire-hot Venus was uh, charming Rosalie to love her. So fair, fire-hot Venus, who's the goddess of love, would quite naturally have children who burn in love. So it really does look that uh, Venus is the mother of Shakespeare's children, uh, but also we have this rose-cheeked element to it. Rose-cheeked. And we're told that Shakespeare's children have rosy, tainted features. So it looks more and more, since we know that Venus has seduced, uh, Penelope Rich has seduced Rosalie, that uh, those two are the natural parents of uh, Edward Vere's uh, children, since they're rosy, tainted, and they burn in love. OK, let's keep uh, going on this, because we're about to find a lot more that is interesting and revealing. So fair fire hot Venus, charming him to love her, chaste Lucretia virgin, like her dresses. So Venus, who is the mistress of Edward de Vere and the seductress of Henry Rosalie, dresses like chaste Lucretia virgin. So in other words, she puts on a front of pretending to be chaste. Um, now, why I say that's particularly interesting is because we can pull on another thread to find more about her. Remember, we're looking at the woven cloth of Weaver. So just as a last note, I'm putting in the Penelope Rich column, fair, fire-hot Venus dressed as chaste Lucretia. OK, let's now pull on this thread in this tapestry and see where it leads us. It leads us to epigram 8 of week 2. That's chapter 2. Cario brags and swears his wife's a maid, a lovely Lucrece, or Diana rather, some sacred saint in woman's clothes arrayed, and why? His children are so like their father. Yet Cario's cousin, that means deceived, do whate'er he can, she thinks of him, lies with another man. Now, why I've pulled up this particular epigram is for the obvious connection. In the Shakespeare poem, we had hot Venus, uh, dressed up like Lucretia Virgin. Here we have a husband swearing and bragging that his wife's a maid, a chaste, a lovely Lucrece, or Diana, rather. And not only that, uh, in the Shakespeare poem, we have their sugared tongues and power-attractive beauty say they are saints, although what saints they show not for thousands vows to them subjective duty. Uh, in other words, it's being put about that these people are saints, uh, but they're not showing subjective duty, as indeed a wife ought to in those days to her husband. Um, so they're not looking like saints actually at all. And in Epigram 8 at the top, we have Gary, uh, Cario bragging of his wife uh, that she's some sacred saint in woman's clothes arrayed. So we've got the link both to Lucrece and to saints. And in both cases, we've got someone who's sleeping about um, and who is putting on a front of being chaste, virgin. Um, notice also that Cario brags and swears his wife has made a lovely Lucrece or Diana. Lucrece and Diana, of course. Diana is the word very much name associated with Penelope Rich. And Lucrece, of course, means rich. So another big clue there. OK. Um, Yet, uh, uh, and and why? His children are so like their father. In other words, his children also, Penelope Rich had 11 children, actually, by two different men, uh, met many of them out of wedlock, and they're all saying that she's chaste. They're all boasting that she's chaste. But uh, 
Weaver knows she's not. Yet Cario's cousin, he is deceived, do what e'er he can, she thinks of him, lies with another man. As so often you'll find in epigrams, the last line has a double meaning and a sting in it. She thinks of him could mean, well, she thinks of, um, of, of her lover and lies with that other man, i.e. sleeps with him. It can also mean she thinks of him, i.e. Cario, her husband, and lies with another man. She tells lies with another man. She is lying, presumably, to save Cario's uh, reputation, her husband's reputation. She tells lies, and so does the other man tell lies about what they are up to. Okay, now we're going to, uh, as I say, pull on this thread so we can see more of the larger tapestry that is sewn to us, and what better place to look than the very next door um, epigram, uh, in which we're looking for someone who perhaps tells lies and can give us some clue as to who this liar is. Uh, so the next door epigram is linked by the... Uh, catchword cario, and I think that's derived from Latin careo, to uh, do without, to abstain, obviously in epigram eight, it's the husband cario who abstains, presumably from, doesn't get, does without sex with his wife. Uh, in the one right next door to it, cario, well, he's lost his tongue, that's what he seems to have been doing without. Rufinus hath no tongue, why? For now he has lost one. Rufinus hath a tongue, why? He says he hath none. In other words, Rufinus is a liar. He's able to say he doesn't have a tongue, but he wouldn't be able to say that if he didn't have a tongue. So he's a liar. Uh, also, he's refusing to talk. Rufinus hath no tongue. Why? For now he lost one. So we've got a liar who's right next to a woman who um, uh, lies with another man. Is this the same man? Uh, Rufinus, by the way, comes from the Latin Rufus, which means red. And Rufinus is just a sort of diminutive or nickname term for Rufus. So it's another word just like saying Nick for Nicholas or something. Rufinus is Rufus. Can we find more about um, another Rufus? We've linked the two as liars. And yes, we can. Rufus is mentioned in Epicaram 3 of Book 5. This epigram is called In Stellam, To Stella. Now you'll remember that uh, uh, Penelope Rich is Stella of the Astrophel and Stella sonnets. Let's see what we have to stay here. Virginity doth Stella still commend, that for a virgin so she may be counted. Virginity she might though reprehend, since she with Rufus in the coach was mounted. For tell me, Stella, virgin as thou art, to bear a virgin is to virgin's part? Well, you can see what's going on here uh, almost at a glance. Uh, Rufus, which, as I said, means red and seems to be linked to Rufinus, who tells lies um, and sleeps with a married woman. Um, uh, Rufus, uh, Stella, with Rufus in a coach, was mounted. And I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone watching this uh, that mounted has a sexual double meaning. Uh, tell me, Stella, virgin, as thou art, to bear a virgin is a virgin's part. Well, again, it's an epigram and we have a little double meaning there. To bear a virgin might be to give birth uh, to a virgin. Well, of course, everybody gives birth to virgins. and Nobody's had sex in the womb. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it can imply to have a, have a child, to bear a virgin. Is that what virgins do? Uh, but also, once we've had that Rufus, uh, she was with Rufus mounted in a coach, uh, to bear a virgin means also to have a virgin on top of one, um, which is a joke, one assumes, uh, that Rufus was a virgin uh, before he <coughs> mounted Stella. Sorry, this is all getting a bit crude, but I hope you're, you're catching the drift of it. OK, so we've got this connection with Stella, who's Penelope Rich, which connects to Diana in Epigram 8. And Diana, of course, uh, connects to Venus and Lucrece. Uh, and in all three of these poems, we have exactly the same thing. We have um, someone, a woman, who is sleeping around, uh, but who is claiming to be chaste. So there's a great link between them all. And, of course, they are linked by the names that we associate with 
Penelope Rich. OK, can we carry on? Can we find more? Let's look at the epigram that is directly next to epigram 3, the one to Stella. That's epigram 2. Oh, and lo and behold, it seems to be addressed to Rufus. Rufus is the person, you'll remember, who seems to have told a lie um, and uh, mounted Stella in her coach. Uh, some say the soul within the brain close lies. Some say in the head, in the heart, some, some in the eyes. Others affirm it harbours in the breast. Others will have it in the blood to rest. Against all philosophers, I do suppose, Rufus' red soul lies hid in his red nose. So, first of all, we notice that the uh, virginity is the, the catchword that links the two. And we know why now. And, of course, Rufus links the two. This one addressed to Rufus, and the next one we're told Rufus mounts Stella in the coach. Uh, so, what have we got here? Um, the idea that Rufus' uh, red soul lies hid in his red nose. A red soul, of course, red is the symbolic colour of shame, of disgrace, and also of lust. So we've got this lusty, disgraced Rufus uh, with his red nose. Anciently, uh, a red nose is a sign of prodigality and, of course, drunkenness. But as you remember what we're doing, we're pulling this thread through the great tapestry that Weaver has made. And so we're going to find more uh, about the red nose. And indeed, it links here to another epigram in which the fellow has a fair, rich, crimson nose. Edward de Vere, by the way, Vere was pronounced fair in those days. Rich, as we know, his surname was Penelope Rich. There's a slightly appalling um, sexual subtext to that bit. But what I want you to look at is uh, the fact that it links by catchword. It is the next door epigram to the one to William Shakespeare, uh, linked by the catchword honey. Yon goes a gallant which will get repute. A gallant is a dashing young courtier. Yon goes a gallant which will get repute from head to heel in his carnation suit, slops, doublet, stocking, shoes, hat, band and feather, red yard long ribbon. See the youth comes hither, who lest his Dutchman hose should be unseen, above his mid-thigh he his cloak doth pin. Oh, that he had to his carnation hose, I wish him well, a fair, rich, crimson nose. Uh, this one is dedicated to Rudionem. Um, that's a clever name, Rudionem, because it combines the English word ruddy, meaning red, with the ancient Greek uh, rodion, which means of a rose, or rosy, or rose-like, in other words, sort of rosily. And it's about someone who's wearing a carnation suit um, and is dressed in pink and his fair, rich, crimson nose. And it sits right next door to the epigram about William Shakespeare. So it gives us a hint that Rudionem is rose-cheeked Adonis because he's rose-like. Um, and also gives us that suggestion then, of course, that with his red nose, he is the father of Shakespeare's rosy, tainted children. So I hope you're understanding this. Uh, uh, what I'm giving you really is a taste. And I really, really would encourage anyone who's interested in this to pick up Weaver's epigrams and do just what I've done, is follow these threads through this amazing woven tapestry because it's by doing this that Weaver is able to reveal that same, uh, some might say, shocking scandal of Edward de Vere, Penelope Rich and Henry Rosalie that was revealed by his tutor at Queen's College, Henry Covell, in Polymantia. Um, I would just like to finish, if I may, with this poem and you'll be Pleased, I think, to know that I'm not even going to bother to read it for you, because what I'm going to look at is the capitalizations, which you can see are rather odd, the use of capital letters. This was published in 1606, the year before Penelope Rich died, and it was in a book um, dedicated to her one of her boyfriends, by whom she had children out of wedlock. Um, he was called Charles Mountjoy, and he was made by James, King James, Earl of Devonshire. And Penelope Rich 
uh, wanted to be married to him and said she was married to him, but in those days divorce wasn't quite that simple, and a lot of people of Puritan mind thought it was very shocking that she pretended to be married to him, and even more shocking that she claimed to be a, a, a countess of Devonshire by virtue of this so-called non-marriage. Let's just have a look closely at these capitals. You can probably see on the first four lines, very easy to notice that, we have Penelope, all in the right order. And we're going to follow the capitalizations through in exactly the order they're written. So we continue Countess of, and now we go into that second verse, Devonshire, again, it's all in exactly the same order the capitals are written, so we get Penelope, Countess of Devonshire, and those were quite easy to see, and a lazy mind might say, well, that's the end of that. Uh, a more inquisitive mind might say, well, why on earth uh, would you just write Penelope, Countess of Devonshire there, for no apparent reason, addressed to each affected reader, and would therefore see if how the capitalization continues, and it does. We have a C O I. T-U-I, Koitui. I'm sure everybody watching this will know that Koitus means, and Koitui is the dative of Koitus. So we have the message Penelope, Countess of Devonshire, for a... F f well, I don't need to say that. In fact, uh, I can't say that on such a family-minded programme, so let's put it back and pretend we never saw it. I hope very much you enjoyed this and that you will subscribe to these uploads and press the bell next to it to get notification every time I upload more. And there's going to be more on this scandal coming out of Cambridge, I can assure you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.